Charlie, it's yours. Please take it away. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Jade Wong. Uh, Jade, please tell us about your living history. Yeah, so first I'd like to thank Sri and uh, the rest of the living history team uh, for putting together a series. I think it's uh, very valuable for young scientists in many ways. And uh, so today uh, I want to share a few moments in the earlier part of my career, just to illustrate this uh, point that, uh, you know, how did we start from this naive young scientist and develop into a scientist working on our favorite projects? So um, I think this question bears assembly to sort of a biophysics question, a puzzle, which is in, we've seen that in protein folding. And basically how does a nascent chain fold into its native structure? So uh, when I started grad school, there was the Leventhal's pathway or Leventhal's paradox that you start from here. And then as you move, how do you know you're working on the correct path? And how did a, you, know, you just end up into the right structure? So I want to sort of illustrate that with my early part of my career. Because I was born to love physics and uh, I had many role models in physics, even as a child. And these, for example, include Richard Feynman, who I, whose uh, uh, lectures in a physics textbook uh, was my favorite. And then also, in fact, Jinwei had uh, earlier shown the picture of Chen Ying Yang. So Yang and, and Li are Nobel Prize physics winners who were born in China and won their physics prize when they're in their 20s and 30s and uh, for their hypothesis of the parity violation. So they were my role model. But my true idol was Madame Wu, who is this unsung hero in the uh, solving these uh, parity violation experimentally, who didn't win the Nobel Prize. So these are my models. And in fact, I thought uh, my pathway towards my role model is deterministic, just like a Leventhal pathway. And so I grew up in Beijing, where um, even though my parents are a first generation uh, scientist, uh, we had, I had access to many of the national resources because those resources are poured into the capital of China, which is Beijing. So I was a, you know, did a lot of competitions and I was really a confident debater and led my high school uh, team to win competitions. And then I got into this, uh, I got a gold medal in national physics competition that allowed me to get into this early admission to Peking University in 1989. So I then was selected into the national training team where the top five performers in that team was supposed to represent China in the International Olympiad. And after nine exams, I was number four. So I thought the next steps would be very natural to be the first female representing China to the International Olympics, to pass CASPIA, which was uh, then an examination system set by the US University and Chinese government admission system uh, for the physics department. So it's a PhD system for graduate school. And uh, then my thought was to become a physics researcher just like Madame Wu. And I was very wrong in that. So my first major uh, hit, like a uh, major frustration was that the team professors and for this Olympia team, somewhat was a concern that female student will have emotional instability. So on the day they were supposed to announce the people, which I know I was number four, they said they're gonna have an extra exam for uh, to retest me and the four students who ranked below me. So of course, um, I fulfilled this prophecy of being emotionally unstable by wondering why it was me and those who are like not the first three, but me and the other students. Why are we tested? What's the problem with me? So I was emotionally stunned. And then, so I didn't, wasn't able to think about the question. So I was eliminated from the team on that day. And then the second blow was the same year, Caspi was canceled. So, um, this clear pathway to PhD in physics is just gone. And then finally, uh, that summer is uh, apocalyptic in many ways. And then eventually it leads to announcement from the government that all incoming freshmen of Peking University students 
will commence a one-year full scholar, a full compulsory full-time immersive military training in the military school outside the capital. So I felt that after many of these events happened, I was really concerned about my scientific career. And I was still had to go to the military school because my file was already there after my physics competition. So, but I was wrong. And in fact, that was an opportunity because before that, I didn't have our exposure into biology, but during the military school, the entire year, I lived with roommates. Those are students in the Department of Biology. And then um, we had really strong friendship bonds because we lived, we trained, we labored, and we cried together for a whole year. And then later, as we progressed through college, I was able to look into biology more and more through this friendship with my friends who are going through college in biology. And then eventually they are entering grad school in biology. And I was trying to debate between physics and biology. And through that discussion, I discovered and I interviewed at places like UCSF and I decided to just make a transition into biology. So in fact, I joined and I wanted to make uh, a decision to into neuroscience because that was really at the point I thought was interesting because probing brain action, I thought was very similar to the uncertainty principle in physics. But when I met the new assistant professor, Jonathan Weissman, I found uh, the questions of protein folding and molecular chaperone fascinating, which is what he was studying then. And then his approach was elegant, I'd say incisive and very creative. So I become Jonathan's first PhD student. And then I adapted this direct evolution approach to understand how molecular chaperone are optimized to promote protein folding uh, in this sort of Anderson cage. So in the end, we identified an interesting evolutionary insight into these conflicts between substrate specificity and generality to, and to understand this, I started a collaboration uh, with Carol Gross and then her postdoc, Christoph Herman. Carol and Christoph later become my friend and uh, mentor. So Carol introduced me to the world of microbiology. And then, uh, so I chose to train as a postdoc with Alan Grossman. And later, uh, Christoph Herman was Carol's postdoc become a professor in Baylor and then helped me to get my first independent job at Baylor College of Medicine. In Alan's lab and later on my own, um, I developed this microarray-based method to track DNA replication uh, in a synchronized population of gram-positive bacillus cells. And so this allowed me to see many regulation steps of replication we have not seen before, including this genome-wide replication transmission conflict that I discovered in Alan's lab and continue to work on its mechanism, impact evolution. And I did identify conflict mitigation factors, which gave me my first tenure. As we are solving major questions and include this conflict, I thought a more exciting question, uh, you know, evoked my curiosity through unexpected observations which is how did cell was able to so effectively mitigate all these conflict and coordinate macromolecular process, especially this molecule PPGPT. Rigors, who has identified a lot of molecular mechanism and physical chemistry of PPGPP's effect on transcription in E. coli recruited me to Madison. And I really want to figure out PPGPP driven by this curiosity. I moved to Madison and I've been there uh, since then. And basically in the last 10 years, we used many of the functional genomics and metabolomics, as well as biophysics method to identify direct interaction of PPGPP and many of the cellular processes. And so understand their circuit. So there's more and more physics and system biology coming into our work. And at this moment, we are excited to use this sort of insight to explore antimicrobial uh, uh, mechanisms, antimicrobial approaches 
for human as well as the environmental benefit. So I want to sort of end this by uh, thank many of the people who I have, you know, didn't have time to acknowledge, including trainees, collaborators, as well as a few of the role models I've encountered later. And I found them and lost them, but they were extremely important and uh, close to my heart. I am very fortunate to be where I am and I'm still in the middle of this journey. And uh, I, I hope the take home I would say is that, you know, the perceived crisis can provide really new opportunity. And I would say eventually it doesn't really matter how you get there. I feel like as long as you keep on this insatiable curiosity, you're gonna end up to work on something you're really interested. And that's the end, thank you. Thank you for uh, a wonderful talk, Jade. Um, I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. That was uh, very inspiring. Um, so I guess the, the first question um, here is, um, you know, looking back at this, um, the crisis you faced in this apocalyptic summer, what advice would you give to young scientists who find themselves in a similar situation where you know, the plans are starting to fall apart to um, yeah, so that situation to keep going? Yeah, so the, there was a lot of things happened that summer and uh, history has it, not my own personal history. And that would be an entirely different uh, talk. And I don't think lots of people have seen what we've seen that summer. And it's a, <laughs> I really, I don't know. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, it, it is something that uh, my personal journey was uh, mingled with many things that happened to China then. And so, and that's one of the reasons I, I do want to give this talk because it was, uh, regardless, I think, you know, of course there are many crises happen in the world right now too. And uh, some of the places we know, some of the are happening, right? And, uh, so I just want to know, I would just want to say is don't despair. There's always a silver lining behind the cloud. You just have to wait and time will tell. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, it's very inspiring. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Jade, I will ask another question if that's okay, Charlie. Uh, okay, so Jade, I want you to uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on this very tragic self-fulfilling prophecy that you highlighted early on in your life. Uh, did you expect that these incidents would vanish once you were in the U.S., let's say, in a faculty position? Have they vanished? How do you feel? Yeah, so uh, very so there was a uh, quite a bit of this uh, female in physicist and uh, uh, imposter syndrome and how we perceive our own talent versus how we think uh, how where our talents are and uh, and I think Lucy has really uh, provide the answer in the first after the first talk. Be confident, you you are definitely yeah. I remember when Carol Gross went. Uh, said, oh, she's very smart. I was really struck. This is, I was already a grad student. And uh, and I think we don't need just, you know, it's great that our mentor said that to warm our heart, but it's important to believe in yourself regardless of whether you are getting that external confirmation. And yeah. Wow, uh, on that powerful note, Thank you so much. I'm closing the recording.